Today, let's create this very simple abstract loop, which will use very few nodes and geometry proximity to create this amazing result. So let's figure out how we can create this loop ourselves. In our default scene, we're going to bring our cursor to the junction of these two windows, click and drag to create a new window and change this to the geometry node editor as we're going to make the effect predominantly using geometry nodes. Then we'll press this plus button to create a new geometry node tree, zoom in, select the group input, and then tap X to delete it. For the base of the effect, we need a sphere with hexagonal and pentagonal faces. To create that, we can search for an icosphere, plug that into the group output, and then press shift A and search for a dual mesh node. Now this dual mesh node is going to convert the faces into either pentagons or hexagons, which is exactly what we want. So now if we start increasing the subdivisions, you can see we get a few faces to be hexagons, a few faces to be pentagons, but with those two shapes, we'll keep getting a round structure. So let's increase the subdivisions to three or four. It's really up to you, but you can always increase the radius as well to something larger. Maybe we'll go with five meters. Now another thing is just to make these nodes look more satisfying I'm just going to switch on snapping so that they snap to the grid and they align perfectly without spending too much time. Now once we've set up the dual mesh we want each face to be independent of every other face so we can search for a split edges node and plug that in after the dual mesh and now if we scale the elements each face will scale down individually. So let's search for a scale elements node plug that in after the split edges and now if we change the scale to 0.9 you can see how each face has scaled down to 0 0.9 individually. Now the base effect is going to happen by extruding each of these faces and changing the scale based on the distance from some other object. So we can search for an extrude mesh node, plug that in after the scale elements and play around with this offset scale to get the effect. Now since we want to play around with the offset scale, based on an object we have to add in those objects. So we'll set up the animation for those objects as well in the process. So let's press shift A, search for a curve circle and scale the curve circle up by pressing S and just dragging it up till a number that you're satisfied with. So maybe I'll go up to 10. Then I'll press R X 45 to make it tilt like that. After which I'll press shift D enter R X 90 so that we get another copy on the other side like this. Now we need two objects to actually follow along these paths. So we'll press shift A search for a mesh UV sphere and press control 2 to give it a subdivision surface of level 2. Then we'll go to the constraint properties over here and add in a follow path constraint and for the target we'll just choose any one of the Bezier circles. Once we have that selected we can press shift D on the sphere to create a secondary sphere and this time we'll choose the other Bezier circle for the the target object. And now you see if we move this one in the positive way, it's going from the back to the front as a circle. So let's change this back to zero. And if we select this one and move it in the positive direction, it also moves back. So that means if we were to get both of them and change the offset from zero to 100, they would clash at the back and clash at the front. So what we could do is we could change this one's offset to go from zero to minus 100. So let's do that by adding in keyframes. But before we add in keyframes for the animation, we'll go ahead and set all of our defaults. So let's go to our render properties, switch on ambient occlusion, bloom, and screen space reflections. And under screen space reflections, we'll also switch on refraction because we'll use this later on. Then we'll go to our output properties, change the frame rate to 30 frames per second. End frame, I'm going to keep it at 150 so that it's a five second long animation. Go to the output folder, change it to wherever I wish to store the output. Then I'll change the file format to FFmpeg video, change the encoding from Matroska to MPEG4, and an output quality of perceptually lossless. Now we'll press the back arrow to go to frame zero. Then we'll go back to the constraints. And for this sphere, we'll tap I while hovering over the offset and then we'll go to frame 150 which is the last frame and make the offset minus 100 and then tap I. Then we'll come down here to the timeline and press T linear so that we get a smooth seamless loop. Then we'll select our other sphere, go back to frame 0, hover over the offset and tap I and then go to frame 150, change the offset to 100 and then tap I. Then again come down here, press T linear and now if you play the animation you should get these two spheres rotating without any form of intersection. Now, of course, that was one way to do it, but you could have also made both of them go in the same direction with a 50 frame offset to get a slightly different effect, but it's really up to you as to how you want it to look. Now, the next thing that I want to do is use these objects in the geometry node tree. So let's select our main geometry node object. And since I don't want the geometry node tree to keep disappearing, I'll just press this pin icon so that it remains even if I select the other objects in the scene. Then I'll go ahead and select the sphere and click and drag it to bring 
bring it into the geometry node tree and then I'll do the same thing for sphere 001. Click and drag it in. Now we want the location for each of them which we have in this socket but if when the position of the actual sphere changes I need the location to also update and for that purpose I have to change this from original to relative on both of these object info nodes. Now to get the position of these objects and find the distance with each of these faces I have to search for a geometry proximity node and then I'll simply plug the target from the geometry of the object info. Now for the source position I need the position of every single one of these faces and since the output of this is going to be connected into this particular node tree we will get the position of the faces if we simply use a position node. So if we plug this in we will get the distance between this object and each of the faces. So now if we were to directly take this distance and plug that into the offset scale of the extrude mesh node you'll see how the actual scale of the extrude mesh or the offset changes based on the location of this particular sphere. But it's probably opposite of what we want because wherever the sphere is there you can see the offset is very little and as we move away from the sphere the offset becomes much larger. Since we want the exact opposite we can go ahead and search for a math node and set the type from add to divide and we can plug this distance into the bottom socket. Now if we change the first socket to one we get one divided by whatever the distance is and that way the larger the distance is the smaller will be the output over here. Similarly the smaller the distance is between the object and the face the larger will be the output over here. But when we play this animation we can barely tell the difference and that's because one divided by some number is going to give a very small value. So to increase that value we can search for another math node and then we can change this from add to multiply so that we can enhance the effect. So if we multiply it by something like a number four you can see how it's moving up even more. Now we can continue to increase this number make it something like 10 and we get a lot more motion but I don't like the default fall off that we're getting. So to change the fall off we can go ahead and search for another math node and this time we'll change the type from add to power and now by changing the exponent we can get a different fall off value. So right now what I'll do is I'll keep the multiplication value to something like 4 and I'll increase the exponent value to something like 5 and that way we get a really sharp fall off and now we can play with the multiply node till we get the effect that we want. So I think a value of 5 on the multiply and 5 on the power is giving me a pretty good animation so I'll be happy with that. But right now we're doing this only for this sphere and the other sphere is completely ignored. So how do we bring this sphere in? The way we can do that is by starting off by finding the same distance using geometry proximity and position by duplicating these two nodes by pressing shift D and plugging the geometry into the target. Now to actually mix the distances in we can take these three nodes move them to the side and then add in another node to find the minimum between these two which will tell us which node or which ball is closest to the face and that ball will be considered for this effect. So let's search for another math node and this time change it from add to minimum. Then we'll take this distance and plug that into the second socket and now you see that each face looks at which sphere is closer and then uses that for the effect. And this is exactly what we want so that's all there is for the animation and the geometry node section. However the next thing is actually adding in materials for these different faces. So we'll take the group output move it to the side and search for two set material nodes because we want one material for the actual surface faces and another material for the inner extruded faces. So let's take this set material press shift D and duplicate that before the group output. Now we can go ahead and select one material which is the default material for this one and we need another material to select over here. So we'll go to the material properties and we can see that there's no default material and that's because we have the sphere selected. So we don't want to add a material to the sphere yet. We want to add it to the geometry node object. So here we can press this plus button to create a new material slot and then press this new button to create a new material. Now we can change this material name to sides and we can change this material name to top. Now remember we didn't have to add the new material here we could have added it on any other object and selected it from this drop down either way but I'd like to keep it organized by keeping it on the same material. Now let's choose sides here and for the selection we can simply take this side from here and plug that into the selection so that tops get the tops material or everything gets the top material initially and then only the sides get this sides material which is overwritten over the tops material. So now to actually change the material we can go ahead and switch off pin and change this to the shader editor. Now let's Let's choose tops and play with the tops material. So for the tops I want them to be a glass material so I'll select the principal BSDF and tap X to delete it. To actually see changes in the material I'll go ahead and change my viewport display to rendered so that I can see it. Now I'll press shift A and search for a glass material and plug the output into the surface. Next I'll just change the IOR down to something like 1.2 and maybe I'll increase the roughness to something like 0.7. Now we can't quite see what this is doing because of two reasons.
reasons. The first thing is there's not too many things in the scene yet. And the second thing is we haven't actually told Evie to allow this glass material to let light through. So to do that, we have to come down to the settings of the material tabs over here, go to the blend mode and change this from opaque to alpha blend. Then we can go ahead and change the shadow mode to none as well. And we can switch off show back face and check the button that says screen space refraction. So that will convert this into an actual glass like material. But because there's not too many things present in the scene, we can't quite tell the glass effect yet. So let's play around with the other objects that are present in the scene. For that, we'll go back up and choose the sides and give the sides its own material first. Now this material, I just want it to be more or less metallic. So I'll increase the metallic all the way to one and I'll change the roughness down to maybe 0.3. And I want to give it a slight bluish hue and I'll leave it just like that. But I also want there to be a slight emission for for all of these objects that come all the way out. So if it reaches a specific region, that area should have like a nice emissive ring. So for that, I'll press shift A and search for a gradient texture. And now if we just control shift click the gradient texture, it's clearly not what we want. We want it to start from the center of the object. So I can select the gradient texture and press control T with node wrangler switched on and then change this from generated to object. Remember, because we're not actually using any instances, the object still behaves as a single object itself. Then I don't want this to be a linear gradient. I I want it to be a spherical gradient so I'll switch this to spherical and now we have a gradient that goes from the center all the way to the outsides but the outsides are completely black because the sphere is too small to increase the size of the sphere for the spherical gradient we can change the scale down on all of the axes to a lower number until we can actually start seeing the gradient so I think maybe a value of 0.14 gives me the gradient at the edge and now to control it better I can search for a color ramp so let's take these move this to the side press shift a and search for a color ramp node Plug that in after the gradient texture and then press this plus button to create a new stop over here. Now I'll bring this in, bring this in as well, and then change this color to a bright white. And I'll take this color and change this one all the way to black. And I'll bring that one in as well. And that way I just get a thin strip at the edge. Now I want this strip to be what lights up. But of course, to do that, I have to plug this value into the emission strength. However, I need the strength to also go beyond one. So I'm going to search for a math node and I'm going to change this from add to to multiply and then take this color, plug it into the first socket and change the second socket to something like 300. And that way it'll also desaturate it quite a bit, which makes it look really bright. However, that will also make the bloom go overboard. So to fix that, I'm going to go to my render properties, expand the bloom and just change the intensity down to 0.02 and clamp it at some value like four or five. Now I can go ahead and plug this value into the emission strength and control shift click the principal BSDF with the node wrangler switched on to actually preview it. Now we don't see anything because the emission color is currently black. So if we increase the emission color to the color, we'll be able to see the nice bloom effect. So I'll give it a nice blue color. And because the multiply value is this high, the blue becomes completely white in these regions, which I think looks really cool. Now, I don't think the top glass material is actually refracting. So I'll just make sure that the refraction is checked here. I'll come back to the materials, choose the tops, and then start reducing the roughness by a little bit. So I think maybe a value of 0.6 is better and that actually allows the light to pass through and gives it a really nice glass look. Next up, to give something for it to refract, we can press shift A, search for a UV sphere inside and just press control 2 to give it subdivision surface of level 2 and we'll scale it up by a little bit and we'll press this plus button to create a new material. We'll remove the principal BSDF by selecting it and tapping X and then searching for an emission node, plugging that into the surface and changing this one's color to a bluish color as well and increasing this emission strength to something like 100. So that's again something that you could do. Now I feel like I have to play around with the world settings now. So I'll go to my world properties, change the background color all the way to black so that I can light up the scene using only my lights. So what I'll do is I'll just take this light, go to the light properties, increase the radius up to something like five so that it's a much softer shadow. And then I'll press G X to move it front and then press G Y to move it to the side. And then I'll just press shift D and duplicate one more down to the bottom side. I'll press shift X so that it doesn't move back. And that seems all right. I think I'll take both of them and move them closer to the sphere. So now I'll just place my camera by selecting the camera over here, pressing Alt G to clear location, Alt R to clear rotation, R Y 90, and then G X, bring it back. And then I'll also have to do R X 90. And now I'll press zero to go into my camera view. And this is what my animation looks like. Now I think I'm way too far behind. So I'll press G Y X and I'll just bring it in maybe even more. And then I'll go to the camera properties, change the focal length down to maybe 25 and then continue 
continue by pressing GX and that seems all right. Now the last thing is maybe giving some sort of a background. So I'll press Shift A, Mesh Plane or X, Y, 90. Scale it up by pressing S and just scaling it up and then pressing GX to move it back and just bring it back till it's behind the object and that should be good enough. The next thing is the material for these spheres. So I'll just select the sphere, go to the materials, add in a new material, change the material name to sphere and I'll make it completely metallic and make it a little bit bluish as well. Now for the second sphere, I'll just select that sphere, then shift select this first sphere and press control L, link materials and that way it gets the same material and that's actually all there is for this particular animation. The last thing that you have to do is press render animation. I think this video was a nice break from the simulations nodes that we've been doing in the past few videos. Of course, I try to keep a balance by making videos of different types as well. I really hope this was a simpler one and all of you enjoyed it and learned something from it. And if you did watch it till here, thank you so much because the watch time really helps me. I post videos every single day, so I'm sure there are other videos on my channel that are yet for you to discover. So until the next video comes out tomorrow, keep creating and stay creative.